This is our first meeting of our business council and many of you may or may not know what the San Diego County Medical Society Foundation is and does and I just wanted to share with you a little vignette of why we do what we do. There's a gentleman by the name of Art, 35 years old, had gone to the um, emergency room a number of times with stomach pain, had been sent home um, with, some st with some medication, finally went to see his primary care provider at one of the community clinics and um, the community clinic referred him to our Project Access San Diego which is our largest program. The clinic asked us for a referral for a gastrointestinal physician who saw him as a volunteer and uh, that, that physician ordered some tests. Um, the gentleman was diagnosed with stomach cancer. Um, he was then sent to a oncologist through Project Access, another volunteer, and that oncologist ordered some scans, a PET scan, which is a fairly expensive test, which is provided by another, number, uh, another of our partners, Imaging Health Services, and Tom Cleary is supposed to be here this morning. Um, thanks to IHS, um, the gentleman's stomach cancer was staged. The oncologist took the information he learned from the PET scan, was able to qualify this particular patient um, for a clinical trial that he would otherwise absolutely not be able to afford. The patient um, was diagnosed with only stage one cancer and is in a clinical trial, is getting um, oncology services right now and is on his road to recovery and will probably make a full recovery. And this is the kind of, of things that we do, and it's all volunteers that help us with you know, medical services, imaging, um, hospital partners. Uh, we work very closely with Kaiser Permanente, and Tana's here, and Mike's here, and uh, for our surgery days. So what we're all about is improving health, changing lives, increasing access to health care in the community, and um, improving wellness for both patients and physicians and we consider our business partners to be very important. You are our employers in the community, and as employers, you care about your employees' health. So I'd like to introduce our speakers this morning. On the far left in the screen is Michael Lujan. Michael is the director of Small Business Health Options Program, which is called SHOP. You may be hearing about SHOP uh, from the, the, the exchange. Um, Mike is responsible for design, development, and implementation of employer group coverage designed for small employers, including those eligible for the federal small business tax credit and their employees and dependents. Mike has more than 25 years of experience working with small business employee benefits, and he has held positions as director of small business group sales for Blue Shield of California, as well as um, for several prominent general agencies and leading sales and enrollment teams throughout California. And California was the first state to create a health benefit exchange following the passage of the federal health care reform. Um, and you'll be hearing more about what, he, what the, the exchange and shop provide. Um, next to him is Dr. Sherry Franklin. Dr. Franklin is a pediatric endocrinologist in San Diego. She is the current president of the San Diego County Medical Society and a trustee for our county at the California Medical Association. As a practitioner, her payer mix includes PPO, HMO, and managed care Medi-Cal. She is also a volunteer for our Project Access program and provides consults for uninsured children through our e-consult program, our electronic consult program. Dr. Franklin received her medical degree at Texas A&M College of Medicine, her fellowship training at UCLA Medical Center, and residency training at Greenville Memorial Hospital. She's affiliated with Rady Children's Hospital and UC San Diego. And as a trustee with CMA, she's been working very closely on all the issues related to the ACA. As a practitioner, she sees firsthand how changes to healthcare will affect both patients and physicians. And Dr. Franklin has been consistently honored as, the, as a San Diego top doc since 2006. And next to her is Michael Boyette with Kaiser Foundation Health Plan. He's the area director for sales and account management. He joined Kaiser Permanente in May of 2009, and he's been recognized throughout his career for new membership sales, retention, growth, achievements. Michael is directly responsible for Kaiser's existing large group book of business, 
encompassing 126,000 members and is the primary liaison for sales and account management business, lines with Kaiser's San Diego Medical Leadership Team. He attended University of Southern Maine, majoring in business administration, began his insurance career in 1981 uh, with Mass Mutual, and he has also transitioned to Pacific Mutual and has worked with both HealthNet and Blue Shield in the capacity of regional sales manager. And next to Michael is James Eichen. Jim is a California attorney with 25 years of experience, including representing various medical groups, medical device manufacturers and marketers, software firms, industrial enterprises, financial institutions, real estate developers, you name it. Uh, his work encompasses all facets pertaining to commercial enterprise representation. And for the last three years, he's also worked as a consultant with medical groups, electronic health record software firms, cardiovascular testing and health coaching, and a number of other businesses. His goals are to forward uh, private market medical solutions that decrease Medicare third-party payer utilization and foster innovation to improve U.S. health systems. And our moderator this morning is Jan Spensley, the Executive Director of San Diegans for Healthcare Coverage is a local nonprofit coalition representing business, consumers, labor, health care providers, health plans, community-based organizations, academia, and local government with a mission of achieving meaningful coverage for all San Diegans. It was formed in 2001 and has served as the community convener, educator, and advocate for health care coverage and care for all San Diegans. Jan is also a health care consultant with over 35 years in the health care industry. And for 25 years, Jan worked for UCSD Healthcare as a member of the executive management team. Um, she's gained a firsthand understanding of access issues and a strong passion for eliminating barriers and improving access to care. Um, the Affordable Care Act was a law passed in 2010. Um, it puts in place health reform, insurance reforms and coverage expansions began right then in 2010 and will continue to be implemented through 2014 and beyond. And that's for those of you who were kind of living in a cave for the last couple of years. It's not a perfect bill. I think you probably all know that or we wouldn't have as much disagreement about it as we do. But it is a first step and it is the bill we have. So I think that's important to say. But it addresses more than health coverage. And I think that it's important when we're talking about health that we recognize that. It talks about reforms, insurance reforms, and consumer protections. It talks about coverage expansion, obviously, and how we get people coverage, which is the single greatest barrier to access to care. It provides requirements for individuals and families, and it increases requirements for employers. There's also health systems change in the bill. Um, you hear a lot of, about that. One is some, some provisions to expand capacity and access to care through the National Health Service Corps, improving community health centers, uh, not general medical education, unfortunately. Um, it does it provide incentives, what I call the carrots and sticks, and lots of sticks, um, and for coordination and continuity, for use of health information technology, for better in, uh, coordination of care and integration of care and also for cost, quality, and value. That really means better outcomes and uh, patient safety. And, and both doctors and hospitals, uh, their payments depend upon uh, how well they do, how well they perform on a number of performance measures under the bill. The other thing it does, which I think is extremely important, it recognizes that we, needed, we need a national prevention plan. We have uh, an epidemic of obesity in this country, and we have other preventable diseases. And a lot of our health care costs are related to those preventable diseases. So it talks about a national prevention plan. It, provide, and it, it creates a national prevention council. It talks about workplace wellness. And it grants local initiatives. We have one here in San Diego. And those initiatives are intended to address place-based health barriers. And when that means access to healthy food and that sort of thing. I think you've probably, I don't have time to go into all of them. Some of the reforms I think you've probably all heard about, we, and, and a lot of people have already benefited from, those reforms including allowing adult children to be on their parents' health plan. That's helped 3.1 million children, young people, young adults since uh, inception. Coverage of preventive care and screening without co-payments or deductibles, meaning let's get people mammograms, let's get people colonoscopies. 
Um, Pre-existing condition insurance plan for high-risk individuals nationally, 78,000 previously uninsurable individuals are now covered by that plan, 435,000 of those in California. And then it allows some flexibility for coverage for state Medicaid programs. And that, that's predominantly right now through the low-income health program. We have one here in San Diego. That's about ha almost half a million people at this point in California. Another thing it does is it provides for no denial of coverage um, for children under 19 with pre-existing conditions. This is a big one. Um, state review of excessive premium increases, which is pending in California. We hope it gets passed along with some other uh, health reform bills during the uh, special session. It prohibits premium rate variations to be anything other than age band um, region, large geographic region, and tobacco use. And previously that could be based upon your zip code, your industry, and um, so this is good for business. And the final one here is premium dollars to health care. 85% of every health insurance dollar must be spent on health care or quality improvement. And that's for employers with 50 or more employees. Everybody else, it's 80%, under 50 and um, individuals. That's a very, that's important because that means more value for your premium dollar. In 2011, for 2011, about 74 million in rebate checks went out this, this year to California businesses and to individuals uh, under that provision. How does coverage get expanded? You're going to hear more about that today, but I'm just going to say it. We heard the small business health, and, uh, health options program through the exchange, the California Health Benefits Exchange. You've been hearing a lot about the exchange. I'm sure that it's coming, it's coming. I hope you have, which is a large purchasing pool, and businesses can, in fact, purchase through that. I think Michael Lujan will talk about it. An individual exchange through the California Health Benefits Exchange will be accessible for individuals and families all individuals and families, and the difference here is that if you're under 400% um, of the federal poverty level, you'll be eligible for premium tax credits, which are really premium subsidies, which will help people to afford coverage. And then finally, Medi-Cal expansion. That's expansion of the Medicaid program in California uh, for those up to 133% of the federal poverty level. Everybody's talked about this, the grandfathered plan. There is such a thing. It just simply means you can keep the plan you had in March of 2010 when this law was passed. As long as you did not make significant changes, there are provisions for inflation, inflationary changes. But, you, but the reason that this matters, and that includes deductibles, co-payments, co-insurance, out-of-pocket limits, annual limits, and not eliminating benefits, then it's not the same plan. But basically, a grandfathered plan is not subject to a number of the provisions under the law, and I'm not going into all of those. The right. other part that's very important is the definitions. Um, we all have heard small business defined as lots of things, under 50, up to 100, under 200. But for the purposes of the law, 1 to 50 is the, um, the, the small business. Medium is 51 to 199, and large business is uh, over 200. This is important. Small business, they get carrots. That's where most of the uninsured are. There are lots of carrots for them and no sticks. The others have some sticks, but as you'll notice on the right, most of the others provide coverage today. Most of those over 50 and over 100 do provide health care coverage to their employees today. So this is that employer responsibility. I just want to make sure that everybody understands that it's, there are differences based upon the size of the employer. I want to also just keep pointing out most of the uninsured are really sitting, about two-thirds of them are sitting in the under 50 group and under 50 employee um, employer group. And so I'm not going to go into, I don't want to step on you anymore. You know, you're not, you're not. Um, health okay. coverage, individual responsibility. <laughs> We've all heard a lot about the individual mandate. So I just want to say, yes, there is one. And that individual mandate says that all citizens and legal residents will, in fact, have maintain uh, coverage that meets the minimum standards that everybody else has to meet. And there are exemptions for that. They are not exemptions for political appointees. They are not exemptions. I mean, I've heard so many things. They're exemptions for religion, re religious reasons, Native Americans, undocumented, if you're in jail, uh, or financial hardship, meaning you're under the, the, the federal filing level. And they're, they're, those are the exemptions. But it's important to note 
that there are penalties associated with this and they escalate over time as people choose not to get coverage. The only group that does not have an option under the Affordable Care Act are undocumented aliens. People who are here illegally, they, you can't document them, you know, it's, I don't know. So that's the story. And then these are additional resources and Barbara has them. Thank you for the uh, warm introduction and uh, the opportunity to uh, uh, be with you virtually. Uh, I would really like to be there and uh, apologize for having to do it this way. Uh, I hope you understand that uh, in order to build, uh, design, build, and operationalize an exchange uh, in less than 12 months, which is uh, the countdown has already begun, uh, we have to be open for business October 1st of 2013. It doesn't afford us a lot of time to uh, travel and spend time outside of Sacramento, so thank you for uh, making an accommodation for me. I, again, I can't see you, but I trust that uh, you can see and hear me okay. Um, as someone who's worked in the individual and small group uh, marketplace, health insurance market for 25 years, uh, the opportunity to get all of California covered is uh, a bit of a dream for me. Um, I've seen firsthand doing open enrollment meetings for small business, uh, mid-sized business as well, uh, and uh, even in the individual market, um, seeing uh, folks get turned away, uh, denied coverage, pre-existing conditions, and of course affordability from both the employer and the employee perspective. Uh, what we have the opportunity with the ACA and the exchanges is a, a bit of a dream for me personally. Um, I've spent about the first uh, 14 years of my 25-year uh, career doing enrollment meetings, so this is uh, um, something that I'm very uh, excited and very honored to be a part of. Um, when fully implemented, the law expands affordability and uh, access to coverage for uh, nearly 5 million Californians. Uh, the numbers are generally about 3.1 Californians uh, will be eligible for subsidized coverage through the exchange. Uh, another one and a half million Californians will be eligible for the expanded Medicaid coverage or Medi-Cal here in California. So you know, the ability uh, to be, uh, have access to guaranteed uh, uh, coverage, uh, even without subsidies, uh, it, it, it's a, a very meaningful thing for Californians. I don't, I don't think I need to tell this audience, I think you guys are very familiar, maybe more familiar than most. Uh, to put it in perspective, the shop, the small business opportunity, because California already has a small group guarantee issue law in place, uh, the, the changes there are probably a little less dramatic in terms of access, uh, but nonetheless we'll cover in detail what it means to small business. But uh, it, to get some perspective, we're talking about enrolling millions of the individual market, uh, tens of thousands or maybe a hundred thousand um, Californians in the small business uh, shop marketplace um, not insignificant but again I think the magnitude of the impact for uninsured is really in the individual marketplace um, we'll talk about uh, uh, this in, in more detail I think a lot of the groundwork was covered uh, so thank you Jan for uh, sparing me the, the grind of having to explain a lot of the nuts and salts of the ACA but uh, I'll uh, uh, turn it back to you Jen and, uh, and to our moderator what I wanted to do was just give you a perspective of what the physicians or your providers, when you go, when your employees go to get health care, what we're thinking about the ACA and what we're going to be trying to implement because of it. So the question really was, what are the greatest opportunities and challenges that we see facing my sector? And each of us will go down. Um, when I think of opportunities, we're going to reshape health care. This is an entirely different ball game. This is as though, this is just like when Medicare was invented. We are changing everything. Uh, there's gonna be a greater emphasis on teamwork, meaning hospitals, physicians, and um, physician extenders, such as nurse practitioners, uh, physician's assistants, dietitians, are all gonna be working in groups. Primary care doctors are gonna be working with specialists in larger groups or bundles um, to try and provide better quality care and hopefully for uh, a cheaper price. There's going to be an attention to increasing primary care physicians. This is a big deal because primary care physicians are in a very large shortage right now. So where are all these people going to go once they get their insurance mm -hmm. card? This is a big concern of ours. And so the ACA <coughs> states 
that uh, there will, there's going to be a 10% bonus for primary care under the Medicare fee schedule and Medicaid rates, which are about a third of Medicare right now in California, Medi-Cal rates, will increase to Medicare rates. Now this is only for two years. So the question is what's going to happen after that? And the third thing that the ACA is going to do is provide money to increase the number of primary care residency slots to pay for those doctors so that we can have more. Um, another opportunity in the ACA is possibly, and I'm not sure about this, I'm not sure I believe this just because I've, been, I've grown up in the insurance industry um, practicing medicine, but it states that there's going to be less control by insurance companies and more control by your doctor. I don't know, <laughs> but we'll, we'll see about that. They're going to insist on limiting payment denials and pre-authorizations, sort of standardizing things. I'm not sure how that's possible because that's going to cost more money if everybody's allowed to prescribe pretty much what they want. Um, but this would allow a physician to spend more time with you and less time documenting. So I think these are great opportunities. With regards to challenges, am I short, am I okay on time? Yeah, you got better Good, perfect. With regards to challenges, how on earth are we going to get the cost down without compromising some quality? I, that is a great concern of mine. I'm not saying we can't do it. I mean, we're Americans. We are the greatest innovators on the planet. But it's going to be a great challenge. How do you spend less money on more people and get a better outcome? Where is all this extra money that's going to be needed really going to come from? There, there are plans in the ACA, but my concern, the challenges are, how are we really going to get that money? Because right now, doctors have an incentive to implement uh, health records, in, or electronic health records in their office, and if they meet meaningful use, they're supposed to get money for the government. Well, I've been waiting a year. I still haven't gotten it. So I, I'm not sure that this is actually going to trickle down. Um, What's going to happen to the primary care doctors after the two years of the increased rate and the Medicaid meeting Medicare rates? Then what's going to happen? Are all their rates going to drop back down? Are they going to still see those patients? And due to the long period to train new physicians and new physician extenders, because we're going to be waiting, where are all these people going to go in the meantime? Are they going to go to the community clinics? It's an option, but, but I just put it out there. And there's going to be a lot more work in documentation with all these quality assurance programs. So to say that doctors will be able to spend more time with patients because they'll be doing less paperwork I don't know that that's actually going to pan out. So these, in my mind, are the greatest opportunities and the greatest challenges of what your physicians and physician workforce are going to face while trying to implement the ACA. Uh, but the, I want to talk a little bit about the 30,000-foot uh, overview of, of the ACA. And there's been a lot of discussion on both sides of the fence on why we implemented it in the first place. So I want to relate that to some of the challenges we face as a country. Uh, you look at the makeup of Americans, there's 310 million Americans in this country. 161 million uh, employees and their dependents get their coverage through an employer-sponsored plan. Then you take a look at, there's another 42 million who get their uh, seniors who get their coverage through Medicare, and I should also include disabled. And then you look at 49 million who get it through Medicaid or the CHIP program, the Children's Health Insurance Program. Then there's 11 million who get it individually. And then we have 47 million who are uninsured. And so the two key points in those areas is that uh, coverage is becoming more and more um, unaffordable. So employers are dropping their coverage. So the number of employees and dependents under employer coverage is going down. And the number of um, uninsured is going up. That's a challenge for us as, an, as a nation. As a nation. Uh, it, it, so when you look at the cost going down, uh, and, excuse me, the cost going up and uh, coverage being pa uh, passed on to uh, individuals, what we have is an economic problem here. Uh, if you look at us as a country, we spend on average about $8,000 a year per person. Uh, that's about $3,000 more than the next um, developed nation in terms of coverage. And so look what's happened over the past 10 years. Employers have seen their uh, medical coverage increase about four times that of the consumer price index. The projected cost of Medicare over the next 10 years is supposed to double. Now, those are some real challenges that we face. And I think it's already been stated this morning that the ACA is not perfect, but we view this as a beginning to a healthier America. 
Uh, there's a lot of things we can do. We're a very innovative country. Uh, there's some tweaks that we can do to the ACA. Uh, it, it is primarily an insurance regulation law. We, re we really haven't hit the real causes of the rise of healthcare in this country, which has to do with uh, 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 human behavior uh, in terms of our diet, our exercise, going to the emergency room, et cetera. Uh, so, you know, we've got some great opportunities here uh, individually, as employers, and as a nation to turn this thing around uh, because I've been doing this for 30 years and I've seen a host of innovative products come out to the street. Um, and we haven't been able to really put a, a check hold on what's happening with the, the, the uh, rising cost of health care. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, good morning. I'm Jim Aishin, and thank you very much for having me here. I, I feel like I'm on a very esteemed panel. I'm sure all of you could teach me about the ACA, uh, but I'm happy to be here nonetheless. Um, you know, I was thinking about this issue this morning. The ACA has been politicized. And the ACA is often the subject of resentment, and it gets a little emotional at times. And I wanted to kind of start with some numbers. And, and Michael, you really hit a lot of these numbers, but my numbers are 50 million, number one, number 50, 8,015 percent. Um, so we had about roughly 50 million Americans uninsured, and that's that's tough. I mean, as a country, that wasn't an acceptable situation for us. Um, number one in spending in the world, but only number 50 in uh, life expectancy. So and I'm not being un-American. I love my country. I love our governmental system. And, uh, but I'm saying there was a problem. Okay, there was a pretty significant problem. We had a, if this was a business, uh, well, I guess some of you might be saying we should fire the CEO, right? <laughs> so if this was a business, this wouldn't be an acceptable business. So we had to do something. We had to do something very profound. Um, Eight thousand dollars is what we spend per year uh, on uh, medicine. That's very expensive. Uh, we're sixty cent. We're sixty percent above the next highest spender in the world, who has a wonderful healthcare system. Um, so and fifteen percent. I don't even remember why I put that in there. Oh, I remember now. It's our percentage of GDP. That's very high. So seventeen. Um, yeah, these numbers can float. It could be 49.9 million, it could be 47. Mm -hmm. So I, I wanted to start off by pointing this out because I think the ACA gets, um, it triggers feelings, it triggers resentments. Not everyone likes to be regulated. People don't go into business because they like to be told what to do. You don't f start a business because you enjoy being directed. I understand this, I'm self-employed. So uh, I like to drive as fast as I'd like to on the freeway. That's not really a tenable position. Um, so there is a room, there's room for regulation is what I guess I'm trying to say. For example, you know, look at the NFL strike, uh, football, classic American sport. Okay, it's got rules. Okay, it's competitive, but competition has rules and refs. The ACA is a pretty good law. I mean, I, I feel like I'm a pretty independent thinker. Um, it's a pretty good law. It could be worse, it could be better, but it's pretty good. I think it does a very good job of addressing the problems our country's facing. So I, I really wanted to start off this panel. My talk, I wanted just to point out, this is a good law. I mean, it's got some problems, but all in all, it's a lot better than it's bad. So why don't we stop off with some uh, panel questions? And I'm gonna direct my first one to uh, Michael Boyette. The first question is, what possible changes to the current health insurance options do you, will be available to businesses and their employees under the Affordable Care Act? What do you, how do you see those, this change? Well, I'm sure this is a, a question that uh, Michael Lujan would like to t uh, chime into as well, but I'll start out. In terms of products, uh, you're not going to see really any, any fundamental changes in products with HMO, deductible HMOs, PPO, POS, and so forth. <clears throat> what you will see is the ACA will ratchet back some of the deductibles on the consumer-driven health plan, so those are the higher ones, so that you limit the out-of-pocket costs. Uh, and of course, with the uh, with the introduction of the exchanges, they're gonna, and I think you've read some of the material that's been handed out, that we're gonna have what's called metal plans, starting from the bronze, working its way up to the platinum plans. Uh, and our hope in the exchange is that uh, to offer something of value that employers will allow their, uh, the exchange will allow their employees 
to choose the plan, the carrier, and the, and the uh, benefit plans that they offer uh, as a choice as opposed to what you currently get uh, outside the exchange, which is that you go to a specific carrier and provide those, and, they, and you purchase the plans in which they can offer you depending on the size of your employer group. Um, I think there's going to be uh, a greater focus on prevention and uh, population management as it, as it relates to uh, chronic medical conditions. Uh, from a delivery standpoint, I think you're going to see, and you're already seeing that now, uh, it's really the pendulum. Uh, when HMOs first came out in the 70s, there was a limited number of providers you could go to. And so what they started to do was contract with more provider groups, and suddenly there was choice everywhere, and it became a commodity. Now you're seeing that pendulum swing back to we're going to narrow networks where the health plans are starting to contract with specific medical delivery systems uh, in, in order to be able to control those medical costs. So in terms of options between products and uh, network, those are the, some of the changes that I think you'll see uh, in the coming years. Uh, well, very briefly, and, and thank you, uh, Michael, for uh, giving me a lead in to do that. Uh, from an exchange perspective, I think I would add to that uh, standardization of benefits. Uh, one of the things the ACA does or attempts to do is try to simplify and take out the confusion of the uh, selection and the shopping process for the consumer. So in the current marketplace, it's not, uh, there are no benefit standardization and it can be difficult and sometimes confusing for consumers to compare and shop plans. So I think you'll see some standardization um, of benefits. Uh, in the exchange, for example, we're negotiating with the health plans now who will be bidding to participate in the exchange and they'll be given a choice of both standardized benefits as well as options to include um, uh, if you will, custom plans uh, that are outside of the standardized benefits. Um, uh, I'm sure it'll probably come up in our discussion. You'll probably see more uh, accountable care organizations or ACOs come into the mix. Uh, you're already seeing them uh, in California, but in, in 2014, we'll see more of that. Um, I will add uh, that the exchange is very much counting on innovation and the health plans to bring their creativity in terms of plan offerings and uh, plan design. Uh, our role, I think, is really in providing the choice architecture. Uh, so as the, to your question, the federal ACA uh, requires one standard option that is uh, not broadly available in the marketplace today, which is a degree of employee choice. Uh, so meaning, uh, Every state exchange must offer some degree of, or some uh, uh, employee choice. Historically, small businesses have been much less likely to, to offer coverage to their employees, and there are a number of reasons from that. One of the biggest ones is cost. So how do you, Jim Eichen, <laughs> see um, small businesses responding to the Affordable Care Act and to the exchange? Let me look into my crystal ball. Please. Um, <laughs> Well, first of all, and then sell it to me, and then sell it to you. <laughs> That's very market oriented. <laughs> yeah. um, so, uh, so small business has historically not insured as many employees as larger business, and it's pretty logical. It's cost. Small business has more liquidity challenges, and it's more difficult for small business to accomplish that. The ACA does provide some carrots, um, to use the analogy, uh, some benefits. There are tax credits based on the wage level of the employees that may, they may qualify for health uh, care uh, uh, exemption or, or credits. Uh, there are wellness grants that are available. If companies haven't had a prior wellness program, they may qualify for grants to implement a wellness program. But I think the number one benefit will be increased competition in the insurance marketplace. If there's one thing people seem to agree on, it's that the these health exchanges are going to foster competition and with the limitations on profit retention, you know, the 80 percent, 85 percent, I think everyone seems to agree. I haven't heard anyone say otherwise. Everyone thinks insurance is going to get very competitive, that there'll be different plans out there. These plans are going to be rated so consumers will be able to look at plans and say, that's a better plan. I'm willing to pay X or Y. And the anticipation is that because of competition for premium, more small businesses will opt to um, cover those plans, and there'll be more options for employees seeking coverage. Thank you. Anybody want to comment on that? Did you want to? 
Well, okay. I, I, would, I would just add to that that uh, we talk about exchanges, and I don't know if many of you are familiar with this. Uh, there will be a lot of competing private exchanges that are being formed. Uh, a lot of consulting firms out there are putting together their own private exchanges. Uh, the reasons behind that are varied. Uh, but I also think that you'll, um, you know, you talk about competition. We've had competition in this industry for a very long time, and oftentimes we, we see that the carrier will uh, remove operating margin in order to pull membership in. But once that membership matures, uh, and you have to face the reality of the risk that you're underwriting, those premiums tend to go up, and we've seen this cycle. So I, I think the competition will really be the, the coming together of delivery systems, uh, medical groups, uh, and health plans, and working at ways to better control costs. Today's marketplace is really all about rates and benefits. Tomorrow's marketplace is going to be more about prevention and value. And that's really what you need to look at as a consumer, is to look at what is the value that that delivery system, those, these ACOs that are coming together, what are they providing you and how they control costs going forward? Well, okay, you go less than a minute. Okay. Really quickly, I, I agree with what you're saying. I think one of the key reasons why, even though there was competition, there wasn't much migration, is because of the pre-existing condition problem. So, you know, if, if you were a small business owner or you're an employee and you have a plan, there might have been competition to get you in that plan, but then if you have any kind of intervention or illness back before the ACA, it would be very easy for me to be denied if I wanted to change my plan, change my carrier, move, migrate. You know, I, I had to pay COBRA premiums if I, if I left. So I, I do think the ACA's insurance um, innovations, especially with taking away the denial of coverage for pre-existing conditions, is really going to trigger a lot more competition because well, people. Talking, you're talking about some freedom of mobility, right? And access, You'll be able to but, move. But I, but I happen to also agree with him yeah. because a dollar is a dollar, and right. actuarial value is yeah. actual value. If we don't change the healthcare delivery system or the underlying. Cost. I agree with yeah. that too. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. And he makes line. he makes a great point. The only thing that I, I want to separate this is this is not the we presidential debate. Agree. But <laughs> the, it, 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 when you talk about pre-existing conditions, that really took place in the individual market. Yeah. That was uh, that to me that was the impetus that drove the decision that took us over the top. We've been talking about healthcare reform since I've been in the industry and even before that, but there have been protection um, um, provisions in place for the uh, small for, for small group and the large group as yeah. well in terms of pre-acts. It didn't, if you took them on, you took right. on everybody. With the Cadillac plan, yeah. you're right. Yeah. It's true. I, 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 I'm, I'm going to cut this off. Sure. And, and because I think it is important, and we kind of went to a question about this, ex you know, what it is, and you mentioned the exchange, and you mentioned other exchanges. so. I'm going to turn again to you, Michael Lujan. You've got a couple minutes here. Um, what are the benefits of buying through the exchange? And I'm especially um, focusing on small business. And how will that? How will you engage and enroll purchasers? Sure. Yeah, the exchange. Uh, the exchange will be a new marketplace for California small business and the individual market uh, segment. Uh, for individual, it's the place where consumers uh, can shop and compare multiple plans. Uh, in a more clear and uh, easy way with the support of uh, enrollment assistance of a navigator, an assister, or your familiar health insurance agent. Uh, we're creating a, a, a platform or a system that allows for either online or in-person or a combination of, of enrollment options uh, and uh, with a, a specific emphasis in reaching the uninsured uh, in their community and in their preferred language. Um, for many, this includes the advanced tax uh, subsidy, which uh, will make affordability real for the first time for many. Uh, for small business, it's another competitive option for employers. As I mentioned before, we've already had guarantee issue coverage and choice of uh, plans or competition is uh, pretty decent, I think, in California compared to other states. So uh, what this allows in California is uh, allowing uh, health plans to compete for uh, employee enrollment in California, uh, and again, through a, a level of choice, employee choice that's not broadly available in the current marketplace. Um, the exchange doesn't quite know who's going to participate in the exchange yet, but we expect uh, it to be a pretty full, uh, robust menu of health plans uh, to compete for, for business in the exchange uh, for both employee, the small group segment, and the individual exchange. Uh, the online enrollment platform we're building that now. Um, being developed as we speak 
but it will be very uh, sensitive and very, and very uh, much aimed at uh, providing a consumer-friendly um, uh, experience, which, you know, quite frankly today, I think the insurance industry is uh, not terribly consumer-focused and can be very confusing. So I think that will be a very notable difference for the exchange. Um, and again, uh, allowing for in multi-carrier, in-person, or uh, online enrollment. Um, the employer selection of a tier, as I described, is the, the federal requirement of the ACA. Again, it's, a, it's an option that uh, isn't broadly offered in the marketplace today. So in, in that scenario, you could have an employer picking a, a level of benefit or a, a, a metal tier and employees being able to select from you know, Kaiser, Anthem, Blue Shield, Sharp Health Plan, any number of uh, multiple plans that uh, even very large employers don't have that degree of choice. Um, the exchange is also the place where federal uh, tax credits for small business uh, will be eligible and only in the exchange. Um, today that is available as of 2010, uh, yet many small businesses aren't taking advantage of it. I think the national figures, less than 5% of small businesses that are eligible for the tax credit have taken advantage of it. Uh, so, uh, in 2014, the exchange will be the only place where that uh, uh, employer small business tax credit is, is, is that applicable. Thank you, Michael. And, uh, and if I may, I just briefly, the exchange is making a, a deliberate effort to coordinate enrollment in the individual market as well. So, for dependents who waive off of their employer plan, uh, the exchange is planning on coordinating that enrollment. Um, if they waive dependent coverage on the employer plan, we will uh, coordinate coverage to enroll them in subsidized or non-subsidized coverage in the individual market. Again, the goal being getting all of California coverage. I, I, there's one concern that's been raised in a lot of forums, and I've heard it quite a bit. You, you touched on it, and I'd like you to expand on it. it about, this is a newly insured population. And do we have enough physicians and other health care providers to care for them? Comes up all the time. I keep hearing about the waiting lines in the ER and, and in the doctor's office and how long it will take to get an appointment. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, we do not have the infrastructure ready for all the patients that are going to have an insurance card. The CBO estimates that about 32 million of an estimated 54 million uninsured Americans are going to obtain coverage because of the ACA. It's largely, at least one-third of it is due to expansion of Medicaid alone. Uh, there is some provision for increasing primary care money and residency slots, but it's only for a short period of time. There's no extra money for specialists, which is where the chronic care comes from, and the, what we call the frequent flyers or the people who need the most medical care. They tend not to be in the primary care setting. The people that are costing us the most money tend to be the smallest number of people, but they're the sickest and the older. So those people are the people that we actually need more money for to coordinate, uh, not just in primary care, at least in the first 10 years. Um, the ACA also focuses on attracting more physicians to rural areas, which I think is really good. So, but we don't have those physicians right now. They're saying they're going to pay them more to go into rural areas, but they aren't even available yet. Um, we're experiencing a shortage of nearly every kind of doctor. We're looking at more than 5,000 doctor shortage in just California alone within the next 10 years. The California Healthcare Foundation has said that only 16 of the 58 California counties had sufficient number of primary care doctors. Counties like Riverside have half the number of recommended primary care doctors and about two-thirds of the specialists that they need. On top of this, 30 percent of California's physicians are over 60. Think about that. And there are more physicians retiring than entering the profession. A trend, this trend is expected to continue. So of the physicians available on top of all of this, only a few of them, I, I don't know any adult endocrinologist, I'm an endocrinologist, that take Medi-Cal. So if all of these people, if one third of them are getting Medicaid or Medi-Cal, who's going to see them for their diabetes? Shortages mean delayed care, higher level of acuity, and people increasingly accessing the system. They're going to have longer waits. They're going to go to the emergency room. So this shortage is real, and we're going to have to deal with it in some way. I'm curious about how the Affordable Care Act will help slow the rise in the cost of care. You alluded to some of this in terms of the competitive uh, 
the side. But what, what can businesses and individuals do to help keep costs down? And how can employers be smarter purchasers to help in that as well? Well, I think, I mean, to be frank and to be transparent, I think initially uh, you're going to see costs go up. And the fact of the matter is when you have a bill like this that mandates a number of benefits, the removal of lifetime maximums, uh, dependent stage 26, uh, preventative, uh, it, actuarially you have to raise premiums for that. In addition, there's got to be ways to fund it. So we've got fees, uh, taxes, penalties that will be levied on individuals, on insurance carriers, and also pharmaceutical companies and other medical vendors. So you will see initially go up. On the other side of the coin, there have been studies that have been done by the Kaiser Fa Family Foundation that show that if we spread coverage to everyone across the United States, that could lower premiums by 8 to 10 percent by itself, which is good news. But at the same time, um, you alluded to this, and both of you have, uh, with, the, with 32 million Americans coming on board that are previously uninsured from 2014 through 2019 and what they estimate. Uh, most of those are going to be those who have not had medical care before. And so we're going to be dealing with individuals who haven't had uh, uh, preventive care. They're probably in the stages of chronic medical conditions, so those costs are going to initially be higher. And I think what you'll see is that the carriers are going to be pricing conservatively because they don't know what that risk is going to be. But over the long run, you, I think you'll start to see costs slow significantly uh, because of the creation of an ACO, because of the narrow networks. Hopefully, the uh, organizations will work closer together. Uh, I mentioned earlier there's uh, insurance regulation. We also have the medical loss uh, ratio. That is, 85% of your premiums have to go towards the cost of medical care uh, any, uh, for a large group of 50 and above. And for a small group and individual, it's 80%. So if, if the carrier misses that, there are rebates that have to be paid back. There's state regulations on rate increases. You have to justify certain rate increases. Uh, but I think as, as uh, employers and as consumers, I go back to the statement I made earlier about looking at prevention and looking at value. And all the carriers are going to be out there doing their marketing spiel. They're going to talk about what they provide uh, in terms of care. But what you can really do as good consumers is go to third party um, uh, pl places such as the NCQA, National, Quality for, uh, National Committee for Quality Assurance, and look at the HEDA scores. Uh, at, that's the healthcare effectiveness data and information set. Uh, last year, or actually for 2012, they looked at over 500 health plans across the country. They ranked 474, and they've given from 1 through 474 those who rank the highest and taking care of uh, things such as smoking cessation, antidepressant medical management, uh, cervical and breast cancer screenings, uh, children and adolescent access to physicians and immunizations, and that's just a partial list. Um, and if we're, if I'm going to be a, uh, I'm going to do a Kaiser commercial, uh, in the t in the <laughs> top, and in, in the top 20, <laughs> in the top 20, <laughs> Kaiser has six of the top 20 health plans in the U.S. That's the top five percent. Uh, and Northern California and Southern California Kaiser are ranked eight and ten in the nation in terms of what we provide. So again, go look at value. What does that delivery system offer in terms of its ability to uh, focus on prevention and manage chronic conditions? I, and I'm, I'm glad you brought up prevention because I think it's extremely important that we all keep in mind that the greatest way to control health care costs and these, is to start dealing with these preventable diseases. I'm going to turn to you now, <laughs> and I'm going to turn it to a little more negative thing here. The penalty provisions. Mm. I may not let you make this negative, but go ahead. It's not negative, really. No. I, I don't actually think it's negative. Um, a lot of the employers I've spoken to do, uh, even if they're providing coverage. So if, if can you describe the penalty provisions? Because this is what comes up quite a bit uh, for medium to large businesses and the impacts of the ACA on that. Yes, can I really quickly comment on Really, just I really, quick. really quickly, okay. Really quick. <clears throat> okay, Physi the physician shortage is very real. Um, and there's all sorts of numbers and statistics on that. But we're creating demand in a fair system with respect to insurance. Let the market adjust to that. There are market solutions out there, is my really quick comment. And then with respect to prevention, 
25% of all Medicare dollars spent per year is spent on the last year of life, and that's spent on 5% of, of the population of Medicare eligibles. So while prevention is very important, um, we also need to take a look at end of life scenarios because the level of intervention that we engage in is significant. So, so let me just start off by saying large business don't freak out because really most, the like, vast majority of large businesses already provide coverage. They're not going to be penalized in any way, shape or form. So you're talking about a very small number of employers who right now have over 50 employees and provide no coverage. This is a statistically very small number. So this is not a disaster, this is not an emergency, this is not that big of a deal, in my opinion, just because of the numbers. Of Unless you're one of those over 50 people who don't insure anyone. So if you do, there's good news for you. First of all, the penalty exempts the first 30. It only applies to the last 20 uh, under 50 and thereafter. Um, the penalty is $2,000 per person, so you're looking at about a $40,000 penalty per year. You're looking at me quizzically. You said under 50. I, I, said, I meant over 50. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, so, so in the real world, what's going to happen is that large employers are going to sit down with their accounting team and their health planners, and they're just going to frankly look at the penalties versus the cost of coverage, and they're going to make a financial decision. And that's all we're talking about. And that's okay, because we had a terribly underfunded 50 million people uninsured. We had to do something. We can't send them all to the ER. And so, it, and, and I, I believe that it's predominantly going to be the people that are not providing coverage today. Exactly. Okay, because there is the other provision of not of, of coverage that's not affordable right. and, and or cost too much. For and, and, and in my don't freak out scenario, which I hope you forgive my informality on that, um, the penalty if you're an individual and you don't get your insurance in 2014 is $95. I've gotten parking tickets. I don't think so. Okay, it's well, capped. Okay. You and I can we'll, we'll debate this later. <laughs> what about small groups? What about small, small businesses? What about the self-employed? And, and how are these definitions changed under the Affordable Care Act? And how does the Affordable Care Act help them? Um, the, the first uh, word of advice that I can give, or maybe word of caution, is there's federal ACA broad definition and then there's California ACA definition. So on this particular question, I would point to what the California definition is for small business uh, or uh, an, employee, an eligible employee or, or what is a small business. So the federal ACA says that a small business uh, uh, can be up to 100 employees whereas the state has defined it uh, as uh, every state has the choice of uh, starting with a number lower than that. So uh, we are one to 50 employees uh, by way of the state, uh, California ACA. Um, in, in fact, uh, I think just last week, uh, Senate Bill uh, 1083 uh, merged what is the existing small business guarantee issue law with the ACA. So where the ACA wasn't specific, it sort of married the existing California small group guarantee issue rules with the uh, ACA uh, to form uh, new small group um, uh, definitions. So part of that, what changes uh, in the uh, current marketplace, we used to define a small business as two to 50 employees. And you know, there's a much longer description of what that means. Uh, but the, the definition was uh, two to 50 eligible employees, as opposed to the new bill, which now makes an allowance for self-employed or uh, sole proprietors. And I don't want to misquote it. If I do, Jim, I'll ask if, uh, as our uh, resident expert, if uh, you might correct me. But um, it does extend the definition to uh, full-time employee to mean uh, 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 an employee who is employed on an average of at least 30 hours of service per week. Um, and uh, yes. down some that notes. is correct. Yep. Yeah, uh, thank you. I was pausing for some validation. Thank you. <laughs> Validated. <laughs> <laughs> but I, yeah, I do think that there's some specifics uh, uh, in, in the detail. Uh, so, for example, uh, it adds to the definition starting in 2014, self-employed individual who obtains at least 50% of annual income from self-employment as demonstrated through personal income tax filing for the current or prior year. 
uh, that's a, a, a distinct difference between uh, the 2 to 50 definition today. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that because we were talking about the impact of the ACA for larger groups. Uh, I think small business, and I'm really as cheap as to be the smallest of small businesses, will probably see a, 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 as much a likelihood of appeal for the individual marketplace. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, address that. Um, uh, I think for the smallest of uh, small businesses, they may have to make a decision that uh, says which works in their best advantage. Uh, whereas in the current marketplace, uh, they didn't really have that choice with the individual market rules uh, prohibiting pre acts and uh, not being guaranteed issue. So I think that's a notable change. We've talked a lot about how the system needs to change. How do you see it changing in, under the Affordable Care Act? Well, first, I just want to I just want to point out. I, I I hope that some of my comments aren't being taken as I'm I'm not in support of the ACA. I just want to make sure that everybody around the table knows the pros and cons, mm -hmm. not just oh this is great and we're going to make this work. This is going to be tough. So I just want to make that clear. It's not that I'm against it. I'm I'm all about getting everybody health insurance and I'm all about everybody getting to see a doctor but I'm a little nervous in how we're going to coordinate that. The ACA does have some provisions, and I'm going to discuss it in this section, in terms of how I see our health care system changing. Will this work? I don't know. I hope so, because this is the key. The first thing is that we're going to change from a fee-for-service model to a clinical outcome model. And what that means is we're going to have quality reporting, we're going to have bundling of payment systems. We're going to have incentive programs. And this is for communities of doctors. So for example, we'll be collaborating with hospitals to reduce readmissions. So if somebody gets readmitted for a myocardial infarction or a heart attack, the hospital and the doctors won't be paid for the second admission. They'll have to take that hit. Um, it should help with hospital-acquired infections. If somebody gets a hospital-acquired infection, the hospital system and the physician will not be paid for that. We're going to start seeing things called ACOs, accountable care organizations. Under the ACA, there's consortiums and physicians and hospitals and physician extenders that are going to be working in huge groups. So there'll be a main hospital at the center, there'll be a primary care hub, where it, what we're going to call a patient-centered home, where the primary care then creates, it's, it's like a, um, an HMO on steroids, but it, it just gets larger and larger. So it's going to be Walmart-type service. It is. I mean, it's going to be Walmart-type service, and the entire consortium, meaning the hospital, the doctors, the nurses, everybody's going to be paid a lump sum for the care of a patient. And if you don't take care of them well and keep them out of the hospital, you lose money because that Medicare is only going to pay you for that life. So everybody's going to be in it together rather than just the doctor, just the hospital. So they're thinking that's the way we're going to cut down on cost. Um, the development of, like I said, patient-centered medical homes at the center of the ACO so that we can coordinate care better. We're going to redesign care to include teams of non-physicians. So you may not always see a physician. You may not even know a physician's there. What's going to be happening is other people are going to be running everything while a physician sits behind watching to coordinate your care. Um, nurse practitioners, physicians assistants, care coordinators, and dietitians. There's going to be a big focus on proactively managing preventative care so that you don't get as sick as the sickest do. Um, reaching out to patients to assure that they get the recommended tests and follow-up interventions. So when you get discharged from the hospital, rather than saying follow up with your doctor in two weeks, someone's going to call and hound you. Someone may come out to your house. I actually think these are great ideas. We've tried to do this for decades, but nobody would pay for it. So I'm not sure, where the, again, where this money's going to come from, but I love this idea. Of, being, of going out there and helping people accomplish the goal, because a lot of people just go, okay, leave the hospital, and that's why there's a readmission. Um, there's going to be a big, big expansion of electronic medical records. They, they look at medications and tell you whether or not there's adverse reactions between two that you prescribe. They give you alerts if the patient has, hadn't, hadn't had a certain test or um, a medication they're taking is bad for their, a different condition that you're not aware of. And it also helps coordinate care because the primary care doctor, the hospital, and the specialist, and the radiology group, and all these people can see one thing. 
So everybody's not being told something by the patient who may not be the best of historians. So I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna move ahead here and go straight to talking a little bit about this premium assistance and premium tax credits because there's been a lot of confusion about that. So I'm gonna um, ask you, Michael Lujan, to talk a little bit about the premium tax credits and how that will make coverage more affordable for individuals and families. So for the individual segment, it is an advanced premium tax subsidy, so meaning that's immediate financial help for consumers at the time of enrollment. Uh, and I make that distinction uh, because the small group uh, tax credit is for the employer to, uh, to file for at the end of the tax year. So on the individual market, think of it as being immediate at the cash register, so to speak, and the group side is a, at the end of the tax year for the employer. Um, so the first form of tax uh, of subsidy under the ACA is the expansion of Medicaid, which has already been covered, or Medi-Cal in California. Um, uh, under the ACA, all eligible Californians make less than 138% of uh, federal poverty level, FPL, um, which is uh, 15,415 for individuals and 31,810 for a family of four, uh, would be eligible to have fully paid coverage in Medi-Cal. Um, the ACA also allows for a sliding scale subsidy based on income for individuals and families earning between 138 and 400% of FPL. And this is designed to make uh, coverage more affordable. The subsidies uh, are provided in the form of tax credits that uh, are advanced, as I described, and applied towards the premium for qualified health plans uh, purchased only through the exchange. Uh, it's a, a point that I uh, emphasize because I think there's some confusion in the marketplace about uh, where you apply that or is it a voucher and can I use this anywhere. Um, the subsidies will help uh, individuals comply with the ACA's individual mandate, uh, making coverage more accessible and affordable. Um, and again, the uh, subsidies only uh, applicable in the exchange. For, oh, uh, I forgot to, for the small business tax credit, um, this qualifies uh, for employers with fewer than 25 uh, uh, full-time equivalents. And I, I'll underscore, full-time equivalents is not full-time employees. So you may have part-time employees that are need to be calculated in order to determine whether or not you are under or over that 25 uh, FTD number. Uh, there's also a requirement uh, uh, this would be for groups with 25 or fewer full-time equivalents uh, earning less than $50,000 annually. Uh, there's a lot more detail of this in um, the, uh, I, I don't think I've ever referred folks to the IRS website before, but until we have our information. But do it, it's, uh, website, it's a good flyer. Uh, it's a, it's a good one. Yeah. Has a very good small business uh, website that uh, goes into great detail. Uh, to help define and, and guide small business owners on how the tax credit works. I encourage you to check out the site. And I, I, did you mention that the owner um, and owner's family members are excluded from that calculation? I did not, and that's, uh, that's a very good point because I think at first glance, uh, many employers, I, I mentioned earlier that less than 5% of eligible uh, small businesses have taken advantage of it, and I wonder if those who even know about it, maybe at first glance, consider themselves ineligible because of their own, the owner's uh, uh, salary or income. So that's a very good point. Uh, the owners or the family of owners would be exempt from that um, uh, financial calculation, not from the FTE number, but from the uh, financial uh, under 50,000 test. And it's been determined that that would make more eligible. Thank you. So I wanna, jump right into kind of a controversial question. Why is repeal of the Affordable Care Act unlikely at this point? Okay, and that's a good question to ask because that's part of the, the political climate right now. So, so the ACA is law and it was reviewed by the Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court, and it passed muster. I actually read the entire opinion and shockingly, even though it's a very lengthy opinion, it's a really good opinion. And I don't, as an attorney, say that very often about any opinion other than my own maybe I should say <laughs> but <laughs> did I just admit narcissism anyway um, it's a good opinion and it, it's a pretty good law it really is um, and it's already starting to work there is a uh, Urban Institute Health Policy Center 
uh, paper that just came out this month saying it's already reducing health care costs. That's really good news. You know, that's something to celebrate. So why is repeal unlikely? It, it's because it would have to be uh, repealed by Congress. Not The executive branch doesn't repeal the ACA. Uh, Congress does. And that would require uh, votes that look um, improbable. Is it two-thirds? Yes. So, so I'm not here to predict the outcomes of any election, nor do I want to be quoted in that regard. But um, it, it doesn't <laughs> look, and I'm not going to, but it doesn't look like, and I'm not talking about the presidential campaign, but it doesn't look like on a congressional level that there are votes to overturn the ACA. And frankly, it's already working. It's already been implemented into the system. The way our health insurance system works is Medicare tends to reform or change, and then third-party payers tend to generally follow. Mm -hmm. And and this has already started. So the train has left the station. It's gathering steam, and it looks like it's paying dividends. It is highly unlikely that anyone's going to take that train and derail it because I have not understood or comprehended an alternative to what we're currently doing. Thank you. I, I think that's important. I want to point out that we just got Census Bureau data that showed for the first time in, in many years, especially since we've been having this difficult economic uh, downturn, that in real numbers, the number of uninsured Americans declined in 2011. Uh, with the exchanges, the rates are not going to be ready for viewing until probably June or July of 2013. So if you're looking to see if the exchange is a better option than going outside, then we, we're not there yet. The interesting part and the challenging part about the ACA is that when it was first rolled out, I think many of you heard it was over a thousand pages. And to use Nancy Pelosi's uh, favorite line, uh, we needed to pass this bill so we could figure out what was in it. Uh, so they continue to write the regs as each provision rolls out. And today the ACA is over 2,000 pages. So to tell you how deep it is, and I agree, it's it's a good start. It's a good law. We need to make some tweaks in it. Yeah. Uh, some things that I would I would recommend if you haven't done so already, I think as an employee you should look at uh, setting up a defined contribution strategy, in terms of saying, okay, this is the amount of money that I'm going to allocate to my medical benefits for my employees, and then allow them to either you can either purchase outside the exchange or within the exchange. And there's going to be a variety of plans. We talked about the metal plans that are available. Uh, and it's important to note that this, the plans that are available within the exchange also have to be available outside the exchange from those carriers. So you can define that contribution and then employees who can have the, at least the minimum essential benefits, which is a 60% actuarial and, and, the, and the 10 uh, essential benefits there, can right. buy up if they want a richer set of benefits. Or you may be an employer who really uh, provides a lot of um, money towards their the cost so you can attract and retain key employees. Uh, a couple of things to keep note, the, uh, the risk adjustment factor for rating in the small group is going to be eliminated. Um, the, there's going to be a contraction of the rate bands. Currently it's a 5 to 1 ratio, which is 20 to 29, 30 to 39 and on up. It's going to be sh shrunk down to a 3 to 1 ratio. And what that means is that employers with an older population will actually see their premiums go down and employers with a younger population will go up. Uh, it's like the balloon theory. You still have to take in the revenue to underwrite the risk appropriately. It's just when you squeeze it, where does it go? Uh, and that's what you're going to see happening with, uh, from the rating perspective. So we don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to stop short and, and let the other panelists address it. First of all, I would say that, you know, this is like tax and HR compliance for business. So you do what you always do, which is check your resources, make sure you understand the rules and the limits, and do good planning. I mean, just understand what the the requirements and the penalties are, if the penalties will even apply, and they're likely not to apply, and, and then simply engage in good planning. I personally think, from my experience working in the business community, that most of the time offering health care coverage is because you want to take care of employees and retain key people. Um, it's typically not an accounting or tax decision. Uh, it's typically more of a, of a total corporate vision decision, and I think that that kind of decision process will continue uh, under the ACA. Also, I refer you to a book called Predictive Health that just came out. And Predictive Health um, talks about how wellness programs are paying off 
and paying off very well. Grandfathered plans, I think the estimate is around 48% of uh, small business plans are still grandfathered. Uh, and there's one more renewal left, I suppose, between now and the uh, January 2014 date. So employers, if they're still grandfathered uh, plans, uh, should consider if that still matters. Um, uh, to clarify, the rates are the same in and out of the exchange. So if a plan has a product, uh, Plan X, that is offered in the exchange, that plan will be offered outside of the exchange at the same rate. Um, so as to whether or not the exchange is more or less competitive, one of the things the ACA requires is uh, uh, a level playing field, if you will, with regard to pricing and benefits. Um, employers should consider ACOs, which have been talked about a bit. Uh, accountable care organizations are fairly new to the small market. So I think that would be something to explore as a new product offering. Uh, likewise, value-based benefits. Uh, which promote wellness and uh, accountability at the employee level. Um, I would ask if your agent is exchange certified. Um, the agents will require certification and training to represent the exchange, and if they are not certified, uh, if your agent is not certified to sell in the exchange, they may only be providing the commercial non-exchange marketplace. As a small business owner, I'd kind of like to know that I'm getting the full market for you. Um, I think Jim already said it for employers, uh, ask the question whether employer-sponsored coverage still makes sense for your business. Uh, it, it's uh, never been a mandate for employer groups under 50 employees, so they do it for uh, other reasons, obviously. Uh, validate if those reasons still make sense. And uh, last, get information from California. Again, there's a lot of information that the states do vary from state to state on some of the details. The Exchange website will be live in July of 2013. So at least you can see the options that are available uh, and will be open for business doing enrollment starting in October uh, for uh, January 2014 enrollment. The new law requires that all employers, and I'm reading this right out of the law, so I did don't think I'm, I just didn't memorize all the five things you have to do. Uh, the new law requires all employers provide each employee written notification of existing health insurance, exchanges, and subsidies. The required notice must include the existence of the exchange, a description of the services provided by the exchange, how the employee may contact the exchange for assistance, that the employee may be eligible for a premium tax credit for a qualified health plan purchase, and five, that the employee will lose the employer's contribution towards health coverage and that all or a portion of the contribution may be excludable from federal tax in income taxes. And these notifications have to take place by 3-1-2013. So I think that's a tangible thing that you need to know that we're all going to be responsible for. And there are some other things in terms of what I think would help with small business. I think these wellness programs are a gimme. They're easy to do, they're easy to set up, and they give you benefits. Uh, they make you look better, they give you tax credits. I mean, there's no reason not to do them. Um, the only other thing I wanted to say is that there will be people looking at whether or not paying the fine is cheaper to them versus actually paying or putting money into to cover for insurance. I'm hoping that the latter is the norm and not the prior. Mm -hmm. But as a business, you have to look at that. I'm a small business owner. I look at that every day. So I just want to be honest in what r real people are really going to do. Mm -hmm. Every business should be really also looking at these wellness programs, but also looking at your practices within your business. And you know what are in your vending machines? Just like we're looking at schools, and we're trying to get schools to stop having um, sweetened beverages, and having Coke, and having unhealthy lunches, we should be looking at the same thing within our workplace and encouraging healthy behavior by employees. Are we supporting that? Um, I call it a culture of health. We have a group that calls it a culture of health and saying, how do we promote that in every environment? And, and it's, it's hard. It's hard when you go to any place not to see donuts or other things, you know, served. How many other companies are going to get out there and compete against Anthem so that we see more competitive rates? If I'm not mistaken, their total share of the market is about 24 percent, just to put a number to it. So it's, uh, it's, uh, I, I think the big three are Anthem, uh, Blue Shield, and Kaiser uh, in both the individual and the small group market. So if I'm misquoting the number, it's somewhere in that neighborhood. 
So I wanted to uh, be more clear when a lion's share of the market, uh, it's not quite as some states and other plans have literally you know, 50 to 70 percent of the market share. It's not the case in California. Um, to clarify, the exchange is an active purchaser on behalf of the state of California, meaning uh, rather than allowing all plans to participate, every plan, including Anthem, must uh, bid to participate in the exchange. So uh, this is intended to, as you, if you're familiar with CalPERS, uh, the active purchase model, uh, active purchaser model, encourages the health plans to compete, not just in price, but uh, price is a big consideration. So there is no guarantee that Anthem or any health plan will participate in the exchange since they do have to respond to our solicitation and bid uh, for the uh, opportunity to participate. Um, we encourage and look forward to having Anthem and all the major plans uh, or even regional plans participate, um, but it is not a given that they will or any health plan will participate. Keep in mind that your plans can be grandfathered um, if they meet certain requirements. So you may never lose your Blue Cross if it meets the basic level of requirements through the ACA, and that's what your company may choose. Anthem Blue Cross will still be selling in the marketplace. It may not be selling in the exchange. Right. So I think that's extremely important to state that there's still a market, an insurance marketplace, and there are a lot of folks out there that are working very hard to build private exchanges mm -hmm. and do other things, come up with innovative products. And I think that, you know, if I were to leave some, some make some things, it's say, look at what those products cover. What's the value for your daughter, dollar? Um, and is it better in the exchange or outside the exchange? But there, there will still be an insurance marketplace outside the exchange. I don't know if we've clarified this or not, but if a carrier participates in the exchange, they're required to participate in both the individual and the shop. They can't pick and choose between the two. So that may be a barrier on why some carriers want to bid and go into the exchange and others, others do and others don't. Uh, because it comes down to the individual exchange will probably take on more high risk because of the, 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 new, the new population of the uninsured who haven't had cover, coverage previously. So that is a concern that carriers are looking at. I can tell you that Kaiser uh, is very actively uh, di having dialogue with uh, the exchange. We have every int um, intent of participating in the, in the exchange, and we're just trying to work out the details. Uh, until that happens. If I could add to Michael's comments, uh, it's interesting the perspective of, uh, and it does vary from plan to plan, the degree of interest in participating in both exchanges varies depending on where the health and uh, their footprint in the marketplace. Uh, we do require as our board uh, decision or policy for California uh, that if a plan is licensed in both, that they participate in both exchanges, but we did allow for exceptions, the details of which we deliberately did try to define. So, for an example, if, uh, and I'll pick a plan that's up here in Northern California, a uh, Chinese community health plan is a small regional player that is uh, in the small group market, but not in the individual market. We have no intent to force them into a market they're not familiar with. So in that example, obviously, we could give them an exception. Uh, but there may be other scenarios that we would grant exceptions if the plan uh, wished to participate in one but not both exchanges. Thank you, Michael. You also said earlier, and I just want to clarify, that if you're a small business, the only way you can get a tax credit is if you buy through the exchange, yes. right? Correct. Okay. Well, I want to thank our panelists and our moderator so much for participating and bringing us a very thoughtful program. So thank you very much. Um, I wanted to show you briefly um, uh, a little bit about what we do, why we do it, and then introduce one of our board members, Bob Desimone. There are a lot of people without insurance, with different conditions. It may be life-threatening conditions, not like mine. They can't get help anywhere, because if you don't have insurance, you can't get treated. And that's what is good about this program. I am so grateful. The Foundation is a true community partnership with our network of community clinics, our volunteer specialty physicians, the hospitals, surgical centers, and 
supportive health providers. It's a great way to give back to the community. I think the biggest pleasure for me is um, seeing how the patients uh, really appreciate the work that we're doing for them um, when they come back for their post-operative visits and they're feeling better and they've been able to resume their usual activities or go back to work or take care of their kids again and that's really gratifying. It really is a blessing for me because you know we cannot afford to have the surgery let alone you know have a good eyesight. Project Access is our cornerstone program and all the foundation's work is focused on increasing access to care, enhancing community health education, and improving the practice of medicine. We are improving health and changing lives every day. You know, it is such a privilege to do this. We're so lucky that those of us who have health care and, uh, and we do a wonderful job with our patients and the community needs it and many people are not insured and now to have people getting care and to actually prevent cancer as a gastroenterologist I'm performing colonoscopies and uh, so we're scoping people after they've been screened for the right indication and we're getting some great yields and actually preventing cancers by removing polyps in people so it's very rewarding and that's the right thing to do. We're also supporting retired physicians through continuing education and supporting primary care physicians to achieve meaningful use of electronic health records which will result in better patient care. We're increasing the capacity of primary care physicians to care for their patients and getting prompt answers to medical treatment questions through eConsult San Diego, a secure communication between primary and specialty care physicians. Before Project Access I had no resources uh, and I just had to kind of wing it on my own and now I can get some specialty input and feel like I'm providing good quality care to the patient. As the lead for the Text for Baby San Diego Coalition, we assured that over 5,000 expectant and new parents received vital information to improve the health of baby and mom using mobile health technology. Neurologies need medication at all? Every day we're improving the health and changing lives of our patients. We have an amazing team that's dedicated to finding every resource possible. We have volunteer physicians that donate their time and work tirelessly to help our patients. And it's so amazing to hear the stories of a patient who may have had no resource, obtain a service through Project Access and return to work, obtain work, participate in their family and daily life like they hadn't been able to before. And that's what keeps me coming back every day, that, that inspiring story and the collaboration of this entire community. We have our oh, I'd like to say uh, thank you, thank you so much. I feel so blessed. I'm very, very grateful. And if uh, they ever want me to come back and help volunteer when they do, and I'm more than willing to help out. Uh, everybody was so nice and just the best. No hay palabras para agradecerles todo lo que hicieron por mí, desde las personas de limpieza hasta la doctora Blair. Todos, todos fueron muy buenas personas conmigo. Hicieron el máximo esfuerzo que tenían para. Para este poder ayudarme. There are people who are crying somewhere in San Diego or anywhere for medical attention, but they can't get it. So I would say thank you, Project Access, because what you are doing is what anyone of us can never do for themselves. As Barbara mentioned, I'm on the board of uh, directors of the foundation, and I joined up about a year ago. I work with the doctor's company, which is a medical malpractice company that insures a lot of the physicians. We, um, this meeting was very great. I mean, I mean I, my wife is a, P, a nurse practitioner, teaches at US, D is out there working to expand uh, nurse practitioners throughout the marketplace. My son's fiance is in medical school, so I've got a lot of information to go back to talk to her about and, and understand the shortages of what's going on. But most importantly, um, understanding what this foundation does is incredible, and that's what this presentation would have shown. And to you know, they provide care to 1,800. Uh, patients a year, you know, and physicians, over 600 physicians and healthcare workers are providing $5.6 million of donated services. So we've got the physicians going out there, we've got the NPs and the healthcare workers doing all the work. However, we need, and that's why I try, we need to raise money uh, to make this, uh, to continue with this. So there's a couple programs. Um, this was the first pilot program of this business council meeting. We want to have four of these a year. You'll have, um, in front of you, you'll have different options to contribute. 
as low as $500 up to being a contributor or a sponsor up to $10,000. Uh, instead of boring you and going over it, take this with you, take a look at it. We would love for those who can afford it to, to, to participate. The other big thing that I'm uh, chairman of is that we're having a uh, golf outing at Delmar Country Club uh, February 28th. And we need sponsors. I mean, that's the long and short of it. And I've got some brochures up here. And I'd like you, if you could take one, and you, know, you may know somebody that it would be interested. It, it breaks uh, it down as, in terms of different levels, whole sponsors, uh, major sponsors. And very, very crucial that we get this thing to be up and running to help provide and continue to, to provide the care that this great organization's uh, doing. So with that, um, <laughs>